Um, I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waters of all the different places in Australia that we're calling in from. I'm calling from Wurundjeri country in Victoria. I pay my respects to all First Nations elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to recognise the care for people and country by First Nations people and their occupation of this continent for the past 65,000 years. So I would like to welcome everybody today to today's uh, webinar and also in particular welcome any First Nations people who are present. Uh, today is the first of a series of webinars by Pracy and Denise just talked a little bit about its purpose, so I won't go over that again, but do look at the website. Um, the, we're having a series of webinars which really are a prelude to Pracy's second national conference, which is being held from the 1st to the 3rd of May next year. And the title of that conference is Sorry. Riding the Wave, Advancing Excellence and Equity in Early Childhood Intervention. And fittingly, that's going to be held in Surface Paradise in Queensland. So today, it's my pleasure to um, welcome uh, Dr. Stacey Alexander as today's speaker. Uh, Stacey is a psychologist and a family therapist with experience in child protection, disability, and early childhood intervention. Stacey was the lead author of The Key that? Worker, Resources for Early Childhood Intervention Professionals and the Key Worker online course. And in that work, Stacey demonstrated her interest in the importance of supporting families as part of an early childhood intervention service. Um, so Stacey did her work on The Key Worker and then she went on to do her PhD. And in that PhD, Stacey has explored how early childhood professionals can improve the attachment security of children with a disability or developmental delay. And this has been a pioneering work. And to share the findings of this research, Stacey has now published several journal articles and has drafted a book which has been accepted by Brooks Publishing. So Brooks Publishing is the major publisher of resources of, of, for early childhood intervention in the USA. And Stacey is one of the few authors from outside the US to be taken on by Brooks, which I think gives some in, uh, indication of the significance of the topic that Stacey is going to be talking about. Stacey also runs a supervision and consultancy services service and works part-time as a consultant at Noah's Ark, where I have the pleasure of working with Stacey. So again, can people please keep their microphones on mute and their uh, videos off until we get to the question time. Stacey's gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then there'll be time for a few questions. So please put any questions you have into the chat. So I'll now invite Stacey to present. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you very much for that introduction, John. Um, I'm super excited that you've all joined us today um, to allow me to share the results of my research. All right. Um, so, yes, in my subtitle, I had um, just why and how, but I've also snuck in a little bit of what and where. So we're going to talk about today what is attachment security, what was my research project, why should any of us be interested in this? Like, uh, why is it so important for children with a disability or developmental delay? Um, and why is it so challenging? How can we assess attachment security in our work? And how can we improve it within the context of best practice in ECI? And then where to from here? Uh, where can uh, you and I take things from here? So I've put in a bit of what at the beginning because um, although I'm sure plenty of you know quite a lot about attachment security, one of the things I found out in my research was that only 43% of the ECI professionals um, that I um, surveyed had learnt about attachment in their undergraduate training. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we uh, get into it too much. 
So the basic descriptor that most of you would have heard is that attachment is the emotional bond between a child and their parent or caregiver. The more sort of sciencey explanation is that um, it's an innate, so an inborn uh, psychobiological system that drives humans to uh, seek physical proximity and comfort from their significant others in times of trouble. And of course, this all begins in infancy with babies crying to attract the attention of their parent or caregiver when they're tired, frightened or ill. Um, and when they're sufficiently developed to move about, they'll use that um, parent or caregiver known as the attachment figure as a safe base from which to explore the world and a safe haven to return to for protection and comfort. John Bowlby, who was a psychiatrist, psychologist and psychoanalyst, developed attachment theory in the 1950s and saw it as um, uh, a, pro a promotion of um, species survival. He also theorised that um, attachment security was central to um, the development of our, um, um, of our emotional and behavioural development our sense of self and our future relationships with others. Additionally, attachment behaviour is vital in the development of socio-emotional regulation. Mary Ainsworth, who'd been a student of Bowlby's, did extensive observational research, first in Uganda and then with middle-class families in um, Boston in the US. And she saw the same patterns of attachment in those quite different cultural groups. And she and colleagues then developed a method of um, classifying um, parent-child relationships into those observed patterns. And they called this assessment procedure, which is now like the gold standard in research around attachment, the strange situation procedure or the SSP. So the SSP basically involves having uh, a clinical room set up that has a couple of chairs in it, a basket of toys on the floor, and the parent brings their one to two-year-old um, child into the room and sits on one of the chairs and encourages the child to play with the toys on the floor. Three minutes later, a stranger comes in and sits on the other chair and says hello to the parent and then interacts with the child. Three minutes later, there's a knock at the door and the parent gets up and leaves the room, leaving the child in the room with the stranger. Three minutes later, the parent returns um, and the stranger leaves. And then three minutes later, there's another knock at the door, the parent leaves, the child's alone in the room, and then the parent returns three minutes later. And then this is all um, videotaped and a trained assessors work out from uh, largely the um, behaviour of the child during the parents' departures and arrivals, which classification of attachment is um, most suitable. Enter, see I've got it now. There's four main types of attachment. Uh, type A is insecure avoidant attachment, and this is associated with caregiving that is dismissive or rejecting of comfort seeking. So in the SSP, the child in the avoidant relationship um, may not react too much when the parent leaves the room. And um, although they've done research where they've got heart monitors on the children and their heart rate elevates significantly, but they don't give a lot away on their faces. Um, and when the parent returns to the room, this child may not seek reunion. They may just note that the parents returned and then resume playing with the toys. So you, in a nutshell, you could say that this child is um, minimizing their attachment behaviors um, so as not to attract rebuffal intrusion or insensitive responsiveness from their attachment figure. And around 15% of children in the general population have this attachment type. Type B is secure, and this is associated with sensitive and responsive caregiving. In the SSP, the child in the secure relationship will be upset when their parent leaves. And then when the parent returns, they will seek reunion um, and the parent will be able to um, comfort them um, such that the child will be able to resume playing the toys within that kind of three minute time frame. 
Um, and around 62% of children in the general population have this type of attachment. Type C is um, insecure ambivalent or sometimes known as resistant attachment. And this is associated with low level parental responsiveness or unreliable responsiveness. So in the SSP, this child may display considerable distress when their parent leaves the room. And when the parent returns, the child will seek reunion, but they won't be comforted by that. So if the parent tries to sort of settle them down, they will resist those, um, those attempts to calm them. Um, so you could say with this child that there's like an amping up of their attachment behaviours in order to elicit a response from a caregiver who may, for example, be caught up in their own um, emotional needs. And around 9% of children have um, an ambivalent um, attachment relationship. The fourth kind was um, sort of discovered by other researchers down the track when they had a pile of tapes that they were that were unclassified. Um, and it's associated with anomalous caregiving behaviour. So sometimes that anomalous behaviour can be maltreatment, but other times it may be that um, the parent has unresolved trauma and may experience periods of dissociation or may have unusual behaviours towards the child, like looming or appearing to be afraid um, of the child. In the SSP, this child has no clear strategy of dealing with departures or arrivals, and it's thought that this arises from the unresolvable paradox of um, being instinctively driven to seek comfort from the person who's causing your distress. Um, the child may fight, fly, or freeze, or do any number of unusual things. And around 15% of children have this type of attachment. Children will form an attachment when there's any kind of caregiver available. It's the, it's the pattern and, um, uh, of attachment that changes rather than its existence or its intensity. The quality of attachment is formed largely over the first year of life, although clearly for a child with a disability or delay, this could take substantially longer than that. Um, once formed, the pattern of attachment tends to remain steady, like on into adulthood, um, accepting major traumas like death of a parent, divorce, um, a life-threatening illness of the parent or the child, um, really protracted separations from the parent or alternatively a successful attachment intervention. Um, attachment quality is a description of the relationship, not of the child. It's not like a diagnosis or anything. Just to complicate things a tiny bit, just for a second, some of you may have heard of attachment disorders from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. Um, there's two, there's reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement disorder. Um, these disorders are nothing to do with the SSP. They're something that is diagnosed by a paediatric psychiatrist. Um, they're rare, they're, they affect about 1% of the population and they're for children who've had really extreme neglect or abuse. So think like Romanian orphans or children that have been removed from um, abusive family care and then have been abused again in foster care, that sort of thing. We're not talking about um, these children today. We're talking about the other 99%, the secure, the insecure and the disorganized. All right. Now, so what was my research project? Um, as John mentioned before, I spent the first 15 years of my career um, working both in child protection and in disability services with school-aged children and their families in crisis. And I often wished for a time machine so we could go back to the early years of child and family life where we could have a much greater impact on outcomes. And the more I looked into it, the more it seemed that attachment security was a malleable variable um, holding the key to a better future. So becoming obsessed, I did a PhD. And as John said, my research question was, how can ECI professionals improve the attachment security of children with a disability or developmental delay? 
It was mixed methods research foc focusing on children aged birth to seven years. And there were four main elements to the study. So there was a survey of ECI professionals regarding their knowledge, views and practices around attachment. I did a risk and rights analysis around how the NDIS helped or hindered us in this space. Um, I did a systematic review of the evidence around the attachment patterns of children with a disability or delay and the attachment interventions that had been used with this population. And I did in-depth interviews with uh, parents and professionals and the data from that was analysed using constructivist grounded theory. So I'll put up my details um, at the end of the research papers to go with that. And the thesis itself will just be available on the internet from about um, mid-December. I think it's more interesting to talk about what some of the things I found out <laughs> than how I did it. So why is this important? Why should any of us be spending an hour of our day talking about this? Um, Firstly, attachment security is um, conducive to the aims of ECI to enhance the development, well-being, and participation of children with a disability or delay. Um, there's a significant association between attachment security and a whole range of um, outcomes, including but not limited to um, behaviour, language, learning, maltreatment, mental health, physical health, play skills, positive self-concept, resilience, self-regulation and executive function and social skills. And the interaction between um, some of these um, variables also impact on uh, child participation. So focusing on attachment security in our work helps us meet our aims. Secondly, through the systematic review in my project, I found that um, children with a disability are in fact significantly less likely to develop a secure attachment. So it was 42% compared to 62% in the general population. Even more concerning than that was that they're almost twice as likely to have a disorganised attachment. So 29% compared to 15% in the population. And that's important because um, disorganised attachment is more strongly associated with emotional, behavioural and mental health problems. And these are often issues for children with a disability or delay. So for example, children with a disability are three times as likely to get a clinical diagnosis of a behaviour disorder. Children with an intellectual disability are seven times as likely to get a psychiatric diagnosis. Lastly, but definitely not leastly, um, disorganised attachment has a significant relationship with um, child maltreatment and children with a disability are around three times more likely to experience um, abuse or neglect. The relationship between disorganised attachment and maltreatment is complex, it's bi-directional, it's intergenerational. I could do a whole other talk on that. But for now, I just want you to note that by supporting the parent-child attachment relationship, you may help prevent that abuse from occurring down the track. So uh, if nothing else, surely that's a reason for us to be doing this. All right, so why is it harder for children with a disability or delay to develop a secure attachment? There's factors at the child, parent and societal level. So at the child level, there are aspects of disability that can make it more challenging. So um, if a child has difficulty communicating their needs and feelings, then obviously it's gonna be harder for a parent to um, recognize, understand and respond to that. And there are other aspects. Um, so some, some disabilities might mean that the child has a more sort of idiosyncratic way of showing um, their attachment behaviors. So. Uh, a child with autism, for example, may um, seek physical proximity but not make eye contact um, with their parents. Um, other things might, uh, that might play a part um, include low expressed emotion, cognitive capacity, um, uh, issues with theory of mind, those sorts of things. At the parenting level, we have disability-related parenting stress. So think the Goralnik developmental systems theory. Um, 
parents uh, will need information, they'll need advice, they'll need resources, they'll have to advocate to get these things, they may experience social isolation, and all of these things may impact upon their confidence as a parent. Next, there's the emotional impact of the diagnosis um, on the parents and resolution to diagnosis or, you know, how where a parent is in relation to accepting the diagnosis is directly related to attachment security. And it's thought that this um, might be, A, the emotional distress that they're experiencing, um, B, um, uh, that they might be focusing their energy on finding a cause or a cure and see if they're not yet resolved to the diagnosis, if they're not yet resolved to um, what their child's actual ability is, it just makes it harder for them to tune in and respond to where their child is at now. And then thirdly, we have um, a confluence of risk factors. So we already know that... Um, parents with a disability um, are more likely to be stressed. And um, children, um, these children are also more likely to have parents who are living in poverty, have a physical or mental health problem. And um, recent research has shown that they're almost twice as likely to um, be in a family which is experiencing family and domestic violence. And all of these factors make it much more challenging for a secure attachment to form. At the societal level, we have um, the economic models which cause and sustain poverty, um, societal attitudes towards disability and limited resources dedicated to children, families and disability. Wow, that was depressing. Let's focus on how we can help. Um, to me, the most exciting thing from my research was that there were so many ways for um professionals working with families in the early years, regardless of their discipline or their level of experience um, where they could help. And also that there were things that you're probably already doing that were helpful. Um, this is one of the diagrams I came up with in my thesis. It was slightly more complicated than that, but not really. And, but it had a fancy name, Translation to Practice Pyramid. Um, the number one thing which stood out as important from the data was um, the quality of the family professional relationship. I know that you know this, like we've been told this for 30 years or whatever. Um, so I know that you know. However, it was so powerful in the data that I'm like contractually obliged to shout it from the rooftops at you again, even though I know that you know. So family professional relationships, number one, and then there's some white space and then there's my pyramid. So let's move on to the pyramid. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have um, contemporary best practices in ECI providing a solid base for attachment focused early childhood intervention. They are really all things that help you to have this high quality relationship with families. So the key worker role um, is focused on the well-being of the whole family. You're working on the family goals in their environment. You're using a strength-based approach. Uh, you're using coaching and you're using routines-based intervention. All of these practices enable you to really get to know a family in a way that is positive, respectful, capacity building, and really deeply engaged. This foundation lays the groundwork for you to achieve any of the goals that you're working on in ECI, but is particularly helpful when you're supporting the parent-child relationship. Um, partly probably because you're um, like sort of modelling a good relationship. I'm sure that's helpful. But mainly it's about building the connection and trust, which enable um, families to open up about their feelings when uh, those feelings may not align with how they think society expects them to feel, when it's not all sunshine and roses. All uh, right, next rung up the pyramid is existing practices. So things that you're already doing that are helpful. Um, so firstly, we have um, supporting parent-child communication. 
which you might be doing for the very obvious reason of improving the child's communication skills. Um, however, improving the um, parent-child communication can also improve the parent-child relationship. So if you think about attachment as being the child communicating their need for comfort or safety and the parent hearing that, understanding that and responding to that, you can see that attachment is at the core of secure attachment relationships forming. And that's really well understood in programs like Hannon, for example. And then uh, also secure attachment is positively associated with child communication skills. So we have this bi-directional thing going on. Uh, through supporting parent-child communication, you're supporting the parent-child relationship. Through supporting the parent-child relationship, you're supporting the child's um, um, communication skills, sorry. A similar thing with parent-child play. So most of you um, uh, will be doing that already. Um, you might be doing it to squeeze um, some therapy into the child's day and make it fun for them. That's fine. Um, but we could be more intentional about using play to bring joy to the relationship. Um, still squeeze your therapy in there if you like. Um, but the parent and child are more likely to do it when you're not there if they're both getting pleasure out of it. And then once again, secure attachment is associated with um, children's play skills. So once again, you have this bi-directional thing going on. Next, we have sensory um, strategies and positive behaviour support. So um, this can reduce parent stress and increase parental confidence and reduce um, the negativity in the parent-child relationship. In turn, the work that you um, do to support parent-child attachment reduces the likelihood of the negative behaviour occurring. Finally, at that middle level of the pyramid, we have referrals for counselling and family support services. So sometimes you might already be doing this to, I don't know, make the boundaries of your um, role clear so you can maintain your focus on child development. But you may also consider doing it to, if you are working with a parent who you think may have unresolved issues from their own childhood or they're experiencing high stress. Um, uh, also, if there are parent-child relationship programs available in your area, definitely um, look at those with parents about making a referral to them. So programs such as Circle of Security, Make the Connection, Parent Child Mother Goose or Tuning Into Kids, absolutely there's evidence behind those programs and um, really good to help families link in as well as possible rather than just giving them um, a phone number. Anything you can do to reduce family stress and improve um, family well-being creates better conditions for secure attachment um, to form. Um, but don't make your referral and then, and then go, oh, that's it, me done with uh, relationships. I can tick that one off. No. So you're the one who has this relationship with the family. First off, in our attachment-focused strategies at the top of the pyramid, um, I'm talking about attachment. So um, earlier on, I mentioned that most of you hadn't learned about attachment in your undergraduate training, even though you were studying for a profession where you may end up working with children and families at some point in the future. So I wonder then how many of the families that we're working with um, have learned about attachment. And there's plenty of misunderstandings out there. So um, some of the misunderstandings come from so-called attachment parenting, the popularity of that. So you may have heard, so attachment parenting involves a lot of like skin-to-skin -skin contact, carrying the baby around with you, um, co-sleeping, extended breastfeeding, that sort of thing. Um, and while I'm sure it was um, very well intended, um, attachment parenting does not align with the science around attachment. Um, and in fact, some of it is contrary to evidence. So, for example, um, co-sleeping is an unsafe um, thing to do because it increases the risk of SIDS. Um, 
Another misunderstanding that some people have is that attachment occurs at birth. And uh, if you've experienced a significant birth trauma, as many of the parents uh, who we work with in ACI have, and you hold that belief, you may have never talked to anyone about that. You might just be holding this belief that attachment was ruined for you and your baby. So you could alleviate um, a parent of that misunderstanding. Um, I invite you to have a conversation with the families that you're working with. So see what they know already and then fill in some blanks for them. So do they know how important attachment security is in developmental outcomes? Um, do they Are they able to recognise their own child's attachment behaviours? Um, they may be idiosyncratic, as I said before, but even um, your bog standard kind of attachment behaviours, a lot of parents see that as being um, attention seeking or clingy or just annoying. And um, if they didn't have a secure parent-child attachment relationship themselves, um, responses to those behaviours um, may not come naturally to them. They may have never thought about attachment at all. You could say, I saw this great webinar about attachment and I'm just gagging to talk to, it, to everyone about it. What have you heard about attachment? I guess Jimmy's autism slash vision impairment slash communication might make things challenging. How do you know when Jimmy's feeling unsafe or needing comfort from you? Just be curious and away you go. Chat, chat, chat. I know you can do it. All right. Second at the top of our pyramid is supporting co-regulation. So co-regulation and attachment are very closely entwined. If you think about it like this, um, your baby cries, you scoop them up in your giant calming hands and you gently rock them and you gaze into their eyes and you use soothing sounds or words, it doesn't really matter. And gradually their system settles down and they begin to regulate. And the whole time this is happening, their little brains are firing and wiring and they're laying down the neural pathways which will enable them eventually over time to help settle themselves. And at the same time, you've um, placed another brick in the, in the pathway towards a secure attachment of forming because your baby has expressed their need for comfort and safety and you have delivered. Well done, you. The more stressed you are as a parent, the harder it's going to be for you to settle your baby. So they tune in to your fast heart rate and your tight breath and your distractedness. If you're really stressed, you may not even come to them at all. You may be caught up dealing with all of their siblings. You may be dealing with your abusive partner. You may be clinically depressed. You may have child trauma that you've not resolved and it's triggered every time you hear a baby cry. This baby's brain is wiring very differently and over time, they're going to be more dysregulated and less able to settle themselves. So this means that over time, they become more stressful and more difficult to look after um, than, do, than are the babies of the chilled out parents. So it doesn't really seem fair, does it? Um, so anything we can do to help um parents uh, co-regulate with their children can help introduce this um, thing that may not have happened earlier on in the relationship. Um, so if a family's having um, really significant difficulties with this, um, I would suggest that you look at whether or not there's a tuning into kids program available near you because um, there's a lot of evidence behind um, that program. But in addition, you, because you've got the relationship with the family, you can also be doing things regardless of what goal you're working on with the family. Just start introducing more conversation around emotional states, 
um, helping parents to identify their own emotional state and the emotional state of their child and um, brainstorming strategies together with them. So for example, if it's about trying to um, calm, um, if you're teaching the parent some strategies, so the strategies could be anything, could be blowing bubbles, taking deep breaths, going for a walk, asking for a hug. Um, if you're teaching the parent to teach the child, then both of them are going to be influenced by that. They're both going to calm down. Uh, you can introduce mindfulness strategies, really basic things like mindfulness of the breath. The key point is that self-regulation skills develop within the relationship. So you need to help them both, the parent and the child. All right, next in the top of the pyramid is using video to reflect. So any of you key workers using a, co a coaching approach will likely already be using video to help parents um, refine strategies. And it's no different using video to reflect on parent-child interactions. The focus needs to be on supporting parents to self-identify and value their own positive behaviours towards the child. It can be harder for you and the parent to focus on uh, the positives. And if you're wanting assistance with um, build, building your skills around that, there's um, resources and programs such as Piccolo, VIPP, which stands for Video Feedback Intervention to Promote Positive Parenting, uh, Attachment and Biobehavioural Catch-Up, otherwise known as ABC, um, and Make the Connection all have a video component in them. So if you have the opportunity to do that sort of training, um, do it and you can do it with the aim of you know running those programs um, if you like but also think about how you might be able to use some of that information in your individualized work with families basically the more a parent can notice and value um, these behaviors the more often they'll do it and um, video is just a really potent um, tool to help with that all right fourthly and finally at the top of the pyramid is cognitive strategies um, they aim to help the parent see the child's strengths and um, build the parent's capacity and propensity to tune into the child's thoughts, needs and feelings. When parents are experiencing a lot of stress, and in particular if that stress is parenting related, so things like um, dealing with negative child behaviour or um, uh, sleepless nights to do with the child, um, they can get to the point where they can only see sort of negative things and they can ha even have thought distortions. And if you hear things like, my child always deliberately um, does these things to annoy me, those sorts of things, they're, they're red flags that this family needs um, much more um, support with the parent-child um, relationship. Um, cognitive strategies include basic strength-based practice, so helping um, parents notice and focus on their child's strengths and positives and the positives of being a parent. Um, and additionally, anything we can uh, do to help the parent tune into the child's inner world. So once again, whatever goal you're working on, you can just pepper the conversation with things like, what do you think she's thinking right now? What do you think he's trying to tell us with that behaviour? How do you think that was for her? Those sorts of things. So as you can see, there's a wide range of strategies you can use in your practice and probably plenty of things you're doing already. Um, secure parent-child attachment relationships are helpful for you to achieve any of the goals that you're working on in ECI because the parent-child relationship is the engine room of the intervention. You don't have to have a goal like Jeremy will develop a secure attachment with his mother as demonstrated by Jeremy and his mother gazing adoringly into each other's eyes for two minutes straight six weeks from now. No, no, no. You just, Whatever goal the family has chosen to work on, you just make sure that you have front and centre um, the parent-child attachment relationship. All right. 
assessment. Uh, you may have noticed I've had quite a few dad photos and I just thought that might be a nice way of reminding all of us to not forget about father-child um, attachment. Very obviously, fathers can be the primary attachment figure, um, but the more secure relationships the child has, um, the better. So there's additional um, uh, benefits for developmental outcomes. And um, additionally, there are um, benefits for the whole family. So um, secure father-child attachment is associated with improved marital harmony and reduced parental stress. So it just creates a better environment for um, uh, family well-being and for um, primary secure attachment relationships. All right, assessment. So how should we be assessing attachment in our work? There is no need, nor is it appropriate for us to use any kind of formal um, assessment of this in our work. So no SSPs for us. We just need to be able to notice if more support is required and to be able to recognise when those supports um, may be um, having an effect. So first of all, we need to pay attention to whether or not there are any general risks. So are the parents stressed? Are they living in poverty? Are there mental health issues anywhere in the family? Um, is there family and domestic violence? Is the family socially isolated? Are the, are the parents teenagers? Does anyone have a trauma history? None of these things mean that this child has or will develop an insecure or disorganised relationship. It just means that it's going to be harder for this family, so they might need a bit more support from you. Um, then we have our natural observations of how parents and children interact. So how does the parent speak about and to the child? Are they comfortable together? Do they have fun? Do they play together? Does the parent follow the child's lead in play? Does the child seek comfort from the parent? How does the parent respond? Does the parent try to mend rifts in the relationship if there's been an issue like, um, you know, the child's had a behavioural outburst? Um, are the parents aligned in their parenting? All of these things are important to notice and may indicate that additional support with the parent-child relationship is required. So are you using any of these strategies and noticing a difference? So some of the outcomes reported by the ECI professionals I interviewed who've been using these sorts of um, strategies included things at the child, parent and parent relationship level. So at the child level, it was really developmental outcomes that they saw. And the big four were communication, self-regulation, social skills, and behaviour. Um, at the parenting level, we saw things like improved parental responsiveness, affection, encouragement, and insight into the child. Stress was reduced and confidence was increased. There were, the parents were less dismissive and more in tune with the child's needs. Um, and there are changes at the relationship level with the um, parent and child appearing to be more connected and enjoying each other's company, as described by um, a professional who used video to reflect. And I may not read that one out because we're running a tiny bit behind. So where to from here? Um, as John mentioned, I've written a book about all of this called The Time Machine, Attachment-Focused Early Childhood Intervention. And I've also designed an online training course um, to go with the book. And I'm hoping that both of those things will be available to you next year. In the meantime, I invite you to think about how any of this information may relate to your role. So whether you're a key worker, a private practitioner, a manager, a policy maker, um, a researcher, I'm sure you can find something of relevance to you. We all play a role in improving um, child and family outcomes. So I certainly believe that it's relevant to all of us. Um, if you want to read more, you can check out my, um, my website or um, send me um, an email. 
don't ever be worried that you're bothering me or whatever. I am always delighted when anyone is interested in this topic. And uh, I also have all of the references for this included in the slides. So that is there if anyone is interested in that. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and for um, your interest in this topic.